Your Excellency, uh, Mrs. Richie Gansham, um, Honorable Peter Esklin, um, uh, Roger Gifford, Sir Roger Gifford, uh, Lord Ahmed in absent chair, who is here? <laughs> Lord Ahmed, ladies and gentlemen, welcome, good morning, and welcome to the first UK-India Sustainable Investing Partnership Forum. This uh, forum is in fact the brainchild of the High Commissioner, Ruchi uh, Gansham, as she was very keen to launch an initiative in, on sustainable finance and investing uh, to coincide with the 150 years of life of Mahatma Gandhi. Her meeting with Lord Mayor uh, resulted in this joint initiative, bringing together about 150 leaders from business and finance from UK and India. We gathered to deepen the collaboration in sustainable investing uh, solutions to power India's growth and to drive forward the partnership for the future to come. City of London, is at the heart of delivering financial solutions for sustainable and balanced growth. The UK government's green finance strategy outlines an approach to work closely with the international partners to achieve sustainable objectives. In this regard, Lord Ahmed, you spoke in September this year at the United Nations, and I quote, delivering sustainable development goals at home and abroad matters to us all. And during this day, we will therefore listen to a number of experts and finance leaders about new approaches which encompass a larger mission, one that includes achieving social and environmental objectives alongside financial returns, particularly in the context of India. With those words, may I uh, invite Right Honorable Peter Lestlin, Lord Mayor, to address. Well, Your Excellency, uh, my Lord, fellow Alderman, uh, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I am delighted uh, to join you all for uh, the first ever uh, Sustainable Investability Investing in UK India Partnership Forum. And of course, uh, this year is uh, a, or has special resonance uh, to many Indians as they continue to celebrate the 150th birthday of Mahatma Gandhi with lectures, plays, and exhibitions. Uh, and I think it is fitting tribute to host uh, this conference uh, in this important year. Gandhi was, of course, uh, in many ways uh, renowned, but not least uh, for his uh, legal uh, expertise uh, as a political activist and an inspirational speaker. But he always looked to the future and was fiercely dedicated to making the world a better place. And that, too, lies at the heart of what we are doing here today. Sustainability is the number one issue on the minds of people around the world, capturing the collective imagination of everyone, whether it's from Extinction Rebellion or indeed uh, our financial services industry. In fact, when I was in India in September, I too felt the energy, the innovation and the buzz in Mumbai, in Delhi, in Hyderabad, teams developing sustainable solutions to our modern challenges. And sustainable finance, or green finance as we often refer to it, is an area where the City of London has real expertise. We've become the world leaders in this exciting new field of finance. And we've pioneered modern and tailored instruments, such as green sovereign bonds, and green covered bonds. There are already $25 billion of green bonds uh, listed here in London, and asset managers, UK asset managers in particular, vote for more assets on sustainability grounds than any other European country. 
and to expand on this work and to continue to drive forward internationally this agenda, we recently launched the Green Finance Institute, led by Dr. Rianne Marie Thomas and chaired by my fellow alderman, previous Lord Mayor, Sir Roger Gifford. Uh, and he will give the keynote uh, later this morning, uh, really setting out the framework. And I'm delighted that there is such enthusiasm for this important topic. Uh, and I'm grateful to the organizers uh, and the sponsors for today's conference for making this happen. And particularly you, High Commissioner, thank you very much for your, uh, your support uh, and encouragement. Companies such as Avesto and Idlevice Securities, ICI Bank, uh, Jiva Capital and GIA have always looked at sustainability as a core value, and which is partly why their ESG teams are so high achieving. So it is my pleasure uh, as Lord Mayor to be able to formally open this event in the memory of Mahatma Gandhi. And I hope that we can all progress with his teachings and example in mind. As he said, the future depends on what you do today. Thank you. Thank you, Lord Mayor, for those kind words. And uh, now I now request Her Excellency, Mrs. Ruchi Ghansham. Thank you so much. Right Honorable Peter Aslin, Lord Ahmad, Lord Gadia, Sir Roger Gifford, Alderman, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. Before I say anything else, I, I must thank the Lord Mayor for his great interest in India. He has made uh, two visits to India, uh, one as Lord Mayor and one earlier in the, <coughs> in the last two years. Um, he did the first ever India Day at, at the, uh, this very prestigious location. And he has also celebrated Diwali, uh, you know, which was uh, just recently passed. And this event wouldn't happen uh, but for him. I, I don't know why I'm getting the credit for it, but it, the credit is all, all, all that of Lord Mayor. I also want to thank uh, Lord Ahmed. I know he is very, very busy trying to cover for so many people, uh, but he has still taken out the time uh, to be here this early in the morning. And I'm really looking forward to uh, hearing uh, Sir Roger Griff, uh, Gifford uh, on a subject that I would like to understand more of Though I must confess that I don't know much of finance, I don't know even to handle my own finances, uh, let alone do anybody else's or, or to do it sustainably. So I'm really looking forward to uh, uh, listening to you today. And thank you all of you for coming here. I know it's very early in the morning and it's a rather cold morning. So it's really very, very, very nice of you. I, I really appreciate the presence of so many people here today. So. To turn to the subject, uh, the turn of the millennium has seen a renewed and more urgent emphasis on wider adoption of sustainable practices covering areas such as resource use, governance, and so on. Both intra and intergenerational equity have become important considerations, especially in the context of climate change, leading to greater calls for development of green technologies. What has emerged from the deep concern with sustainability is the concept of green finance and more recently, sustainable finance. India has taken significant steps in adoption and promotion of sustainable practices, especially in the energy sector, especially and particularly so in the last few years. We have done more than many countries in limiting our carbon footprint despite the fact that our per capita energy consumption remains less than half of the world average and less than a quarter of that of the UK. Uh, globally, India stands fifth in renewable energy power, 
fourth in wind power and fifth in solar power installed capacity. And recently we have been uh, reading about how solar energy is now cheapest in the world in, in India. India and France jointly launched the International Solar Alliance in 2015. It has now 121 countries as its members. The International Solar Alliance has been conceptualized as a dedicated platform for cooperation between solar resource rich countries, bilateral and multilateral uh, organizations promoting solar power and the industry to achieve the common goal of increasing use of solar energy in a safe, affordable, equitable and sustainable manner. We have also set ourselves a target of generation of 100 gigawatts of solar power, solar energy by 2022, 40 gigawatts out of which is expected to come from the rooftop photovoltaic systems installed on commercial and residential buildings. In fact, we have uh, set a target of as much as 175 gigawatt of renewable energy capacity by 2022, and our government is uh, trying hard uh, to overshoot that target. Recently, the Prime Minister of India even uh, mentioned uh, a target of 450 gigawatt. Uh, but uh, just to show that there is a great deal of ambition in the government of India to promote uh, renewable uh, sources of energy. So India is one of the largest green energy markets today. I think that should be obvious by the amount of work that we are trying to put in in that direction. And it allows for 100% foreign investment in the renewable energy sector. We have also set up reinvest, a global platform to explore strategies for development and deployment of renewables. It showcases India's green energy market and the government's efforts to scale up capacity to meet the national energy demand in socially, economically, and ecologically sustainable ways. Having made significant strides in the renewable sector, India would, however, continue to depend on coal for its energy needs. Our policy would be to continue to collaborate with prospective countries and the industry towards development of better and cleaner technologies for use of coal to generate electricity. We are celebrating, as the Lord Mayor mentioned earlier, we are celebrating the 150th birth anniversary of Mahatma Gandhi this year. Gandhiji was a great proponent of sustainable living, as also exemplified in the life he promoted in his ashrams, both in India and South Africa, and of course his own personal life. When he said that the earth provides enough for everyone's needs, but not everyone's greed, uh, it was the environmentalist in him that was coming to the fore. Gandhiji's views on sustainable living, however, transcended simple environmentalism. He believed in adoption of sustainable, socially sustainable practices and policies. The anchor of these beliefs were grassroots democracy and equal contribution of the government, businesses, and civil society to development of the country through what he called village republics and the concept of trusteeship. We see his thoughts being reverberated today in what is now termed as sustainable finance with its primary dimensions being concerns for environment, social and governance issues, the ESG. Public finance has been historically sensitive to these issues, but the scale and scope of action that needs to be taken across the world to achieve sustainability need closer cooperation and contribution of all stakeholders, including the industry, academia, and investors, especially as the industry has more and more resources at its disposal. Adoption of environmentally sustainable and socially acceptable practices is no more philanthropy. It is a given if industry has to become efficient and acceptable. Research has demonstrated that companies that act responsibly and ensure good governance minimize their risks. It is heartening, therefore, to observe that there is a visible and growing trends, trend towards adoption of ESG-sensitive policies and practices by the industry, especially those in the financial sector. These statistics published by Global Sustainable Investment Alliance 
an alliance of financial institutions across the world, revealed that a total of $26.1 trillion have been committed to sustainable and responsible investment strategies at the beginning of 2018 in Europe and the US. However, much more is needed, especially in developing countries, which are on a growth trajectory and need sustainable technology and access to finance to continue to grow in a sustainable manner. India and the UK have started collaborating in this area through joint promotion of the Green Growth Equity Fund. This fund aims to leverage private sector investment to finance investments in the green infrastructure space in India. The Government of India through uh, NIIF and the UK government have anchored, anchor invested 120 million pounds each in the joint fund, which aims to raise around 500 million pounds and has the potential to unlock much more in the future. I'm happy to share that GGEF has announced its first investment of 150 million pounds into Ayana Renewable Power as part of new partnership with CDC Group to develop utility scale solar and wind generation projects across states in India. The London Stock Exchange has been a favored place for issuance of not only our rupee denominated masala bond, but also for issuance of green climate bonds of Indian Renewable Energy Development Agency, IRIDA, and Indian Railway Finance Corporation, IRFC. The UK-India Sustainable Investing Partnership Forum is one more such attempt to bring together finance leaders from India and the UK to deepen such collaboration so that it is win-win for both countries. I'm happy to be present here today at this inaugural session and hope that the good work that is initiated today would continue in future. So once again, I really thank all of you for being here today. This is really a worthy uh, effort and I hope that it will continue into the future. Thank you, Lord Mayor, once again. Thank you so much. Thank you, High Commissioner. Many of the issues that you raised will be discussed during the day, including the issue of bond issues more, uh, looking at solar energy and others will be looking at. I have now uh, the pleasure of inviting Lord Ahmed of Wimbledon, the Minister of State for the Commonwealth, the United Nations, and South Asia to address us. I'm so grateful to you, Lord Ahmed. I know, uh, you know, while the while the Prime Minister and all other members of the Cabinet are electioning around the um, uh, United Kingdom, at least Lord Ahmed doesn't have to do that elections as the Minister from the um, member of uh, <laughs> House of Lords. So he has been very kind enough to come uh, in spite of other uh, uh, responsibilities to address us. Lord Ahmed. Mohanji, uh, thank you for that uh, introduction. Um, Lord Mayor, Your Excellency, Lords, ladies and gentlemen, it's indeed an honor to be here this morning. Uh, as Mohanji said in his introduction, um, I, like uh, Lord Gardia as well, um, whilst we may support what's going on in the wider country when it comes to elections, this is the point in time when elections happen that the House of Lords come into their own. Many challenge the House of Lords. Well, there's a real role for the appointed chamber, if not least in terms of the continuation of government. Uh, because, you know, just to reassure you, there are people still occupying the seats of government as ministers, and I have the honor to be one such person. Um, and coming here this morning, I must admit, when we're talking about the issues of climate, climate change and sustainable uh, development, it was very marked uh, coming just across the way from Wimbledon to here to my old haunt in the city of London. Uh, when, I, when I was working in the city, uh, I often commuted, and for the odd train or two that was cancelled. Normally it was about a 40 minute ride in. This morning it was an hour and 40 minute ride in, not least because we have to have the protection of our cars for our rather grand red boxes. So my apologies for being here slightly late, but. Uh, I think I came in more, more or less on cue. As Mohanji said, 
Lord Ahmed in his absence, I sort of whisked through the door and uh, I thought it was a timely entrance. But it's a real pleasure to join you here this morning. And as we've heard already, the importance of the relationship between the United Kingdom and India. I must, I suppose, as all good politicians do, declare an interest, an interest being that my own family, Harold from India, from being the son of a father from Gurdaspur in India and a mother from Jodhpur. Um, it's very much about bringing two countries and as, my, as being the minister responsible for South Asia, which covers our relationship with India. It's a great personal honor to be acting in this capacity. And in this regard, the High Commissioner Rushiji knows that one of my personal heroes was indeed the great, revered Mohandas Mahatma Gandhiji. And even today, 150 years after his birth, the life and teachings, indeed we've seen it in the speeches already this morning, have reflected his influence on the wider world. They continue to be an inspiration, not just for the Indians he inspired during the cause for independence, but here today in 2019, his words, his reflections, his wisdom, impact and inspire millions around the world, myself included. Gandhiji famously said about changing the world without lifting fingers, that you could do so much through peaceful means as we bring about change in the wider world. And as we consider ways to fund action against this most important challenge of climate change at this forum today, and I pay tribute to the Lord Mayor and the High Commissioner for convening this forum, I'm sure that the legacy of Gandhiji, his legacy of peace, his legacy of harmony, is a fitting inspiration for us all to help us live with more harmony, with more sustainability, with more peace, in the wider world. I was fortunate to be on a visit to India last month. Now, it was my first visit since the appointment uh, of the new prime minister and his assignment to me of the portfolio for South Asia. So it was my first minister, ministerial visit as minister for India. And I actually arrived the day after the 150th anniversary. And it was a great honor for me personally to pay respects at the Rajgarh and lay a wreath on behalf of the British government in remembrance of the great Gandhiji. And as we look back on Gandhiji's most inspiring life, I was also in India about looking forward. As the Lord Mayor said, it's about building future relationships to celebrate all the many ways in which the United Kingdom and India are today working together to meet the challenges of the future. And indeed, nowhere is this more clearer than through the UK-India Tech Partnership, which will unlock funding to deliver work against India's socio-economic priorities and indeed the UK's industrial strategy. But climate change and green growth is a key area of cooperation for both countries. It was a key area of my 24 hours in Delhi recently. And together, the two countries, we are leading the global shift to a low-carbon economy, as we just heard from the High Commissioner and the steps India is taking, and wider access to sustainable energy. But as we've seen recently with the challenges that capitals face, we face them here in London. Most acutely, we saw the challenges of climate in New Delhi. It is important that no one sits back. Inaction is no option. We must move forward and build cooperation on this important agenda. And we can do so. India and the United Kingdom working together to ensure wider access to sustainable energy. And I believe most passionately that there is a real opportunity for cooperation in that sphere. The UK has played a leading role on this particular issue over the last two decades. We ourselves in the UK have cut our emissions by more than 40%. And those who argue that you can't cut emissions whilst growing the economy, well, the United Kingdom is proof that you can do both. And we have grown our economy by more than two thirds over that same period, reducing carbon intensity of each unit of GDP faster than any other G20 country. But as I said, it's not about stopping, it's about a continuum, and we have not stopped there. This year, we were the first major economy to legislate for zero net emissions by 2015. 
these are challenging targets, and we, there, we know that there is no use doing this alone. The entire global economy needs to be transformed if we are to reduce or reverse the effects of climate change, and that has to be tackled at a global scale. The UK is already a world leader in international climate finance, and at the UN Climate Summit in September, our Prime Minister announced that we would be doubling our investment in this area to over 11.6 billion pounds over the next five years. But announcements and grand announcements of money is not enough. Public funds alone will not be insufficient to meet this challenge, which is why we are also stimulating private investment. It is why many of you are here today to share ideas, innovative, inspiring ideas of how our two countries can move together, but equally how we can play a wider role together on the global stage. Our new green finance strategy outlines how we will do that here in the United Kingdom, working with international partners such as India and placing the city at the heart of our approach. And I pay tribute to the Lord Mayor's work in this respect. India, as we've already heard from the High Commissioner, has also played a leading role through its leadership on the International Solar Alliance, of which we, the United Kingdom, are also a member. And let me assure you, High Commissioner, India can count on our support in working together to mobilize more than one trillion pound, trillion dollars of investments in solar energy by 2030. We also strongly support India's proposed new coalition for disaster resilient infrastructure. Our joint green growth equity fund is also showing great promise, <clears throat> drawing, uh, drawing in up to 500 million pounds in green infrastructure investment from global markets through the city of London. Its first investment was Ayana Renewable Power in Andhra Pradesh, which is currently constructing 500 megawatts of solar generation capacity. And tangible achievements like this are, of course, encouraging, and they act as the basis of how we can do so much more. <clears throat> they also show how the UK and India working together are powerful partners, powerful partners and a force for good. However, we all know there is so, so much more to do. The United Kingdom, as some of you may know, will be hosting the COP26 climate change conference in Glasgow next year. We're delighted to be doing so, but we are also looking to step up the level of global ambition and work even more closely with partners like India. And certainly, High Commissioner, we look forward to profiling at COP26 the important cooperation and partnership between India and the United Kingdom. And in this conference, and as we lead up to that conference, private investment will be a vital part of that solution, which is why we must work together to ensure that commerce and finance can flow freely. As we work together to transform the global economy, we must also look to work together to transform our financial systems. When I was in India, I met with, amongst others, the Environment Minister. We looked at how we could do things, not just bilaterally, but not just within a region, but globally, how we could share insights, experience, expertise, technical support, the releasing of finance. As I've said before, yes, it's good to announce, as we've done, big announcements around finance. But when we look around the world, particularly on challenging the challenges of global climate change and the impact it has around the world. We must also unlock the, the ways and means and the mechanisms and processes, particularly for s small island developing, developing states, to ensure they can access finance in the same way that larger countries can. And the private sector has an important role to play in that respect as well. Ladies and gentlemen, Your Excellency, the challenges we face are significant but equally the need for action is urgent. It is vital that governments, businesses, indeed everyone, works together. It is vital we raise our collective ambition to overcome the obstacles, to ensure that finance that is out in the market can be accessed, projects that are transforming parts of the world, that expertise, that technical insight can be shared. And this forum right here, right now, this morning, is an excellent example 
of the kind of collaboration which is so desperately needed, which is required to ensure that we can start working together, generating finance to power green growth, not just for today's opportunities, but to meet tomorrow's challenges as well. I honestly and passionately believe that the relationship with India and the relationship between India and the United Kingdom, yes, it's steeped in history, steeped in, uh, steeped in tradition. But as I look around this room, the strength of the diaspora community that constitutes the British Indian diaspora today lends itself to the strength and the huge opportunity that lies in front of us. I believe it shows together how the United Kingdom and India can lead global transformation on this important priority towards a sustainable and greener future. And in wishing you a successful and productive forum, I'm reminded again by the words of Mohandas Mahatma Gandhiji. He said, we must become the change we wish to see. Let's come together and do just that. Thank you. Thank you, Lord Ahmed, for these kind words. And we assure you today's discussion, we will, um, the private sector will work together with the government to see that UK-India partnership in terms of investment into green growth uh, takes shape. And a number of initiatives are expected to come uh, this morning. And one of that is uh, now, as you stay here, we would like to uh, invite Param Shah. We will um, um, launch the Green Finance Report, uh, which is uh, type untapped potential supercharging the green finance in India. Lord Gadia, come on the top. So we, if you could all stand with this uh, report. Lord Gadia, come here. <laughs> One of that. Come. Yeah, if we can come on the front. Thank you. You can download this. Uh, the code is given on your table. Uh, uh, there, thank you. Lord Mayor, you have to. We will see you. Thank you very much. Um, we will um, now go straight. Uh, I think Lord Mayor has to leave with another, I think, proclamation. And so we will um, have uh, our keynote speaker, uh, Roger, Sir Roger Gifford, who was Lord Mayor before and is the chairman of the Green Finance Institute. Uh, and he will deliver his keynote address on that. As, as the Lord Mayor leaves the room, I should tell you, today is his last day in office, and he's done a tremendous job. So please say thank you to the Lord Mayor as he leaves the room. Um, it is a great pleasure to see you all here and to be with you. And it's very good to see the publication of this report uh, with his detailed thoughts on both the opportunities and the challenges to growth which exist. You also have a fascinating agenda this morning, and uh, I look forward to hearing and reading about the results of it. India has undoubtedly set very ambitious emission reduction targets. It's pledged to reduce the emission intensity of GDP, which I think is a wonderful phrase, the emission intensity of GDP, by about a third by 2030, and to increase the share of non-fossil fuel source forces to 40% of installed power capacity by that same date. According to estimates by the government, that means $450 billion a year invested every year for the next 10 years for renewable energy and urban sustainability. I mean, wow. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I am a banker, and I want to make clear at the outset that we, we have approached this issue here in London primarily from the angle of measuring the risks of climate stress. Because the Indian green finance market is at an early stage of development, but India already has the second largest green bond market amongst emerging economies. It's issued $7.2 billion of green bonds to date. That's a lot more than the UK. And we read, as we might expect, that there are some significant barriers to growth. 
managing foreign exchange risk in a cost-effective way, overcoming the challenges associated with small project size, the absence of supporting infrastructure for green finance to enable the market to take off, just a few of the issues mentioned in the report to focus on. There is a lack of transparency, comparability, and visibility of green projects, and more. Well, I would like to give you some background to the UK's own journey in the green finance space. With now a new Green Finance Institute established, set up by the government, by Bayes, the Department of Energy, and the City of London Corporation, and its first, uh, as the Lord Mayor mentioned, its first chief executive recently appointed. We, and, and I think it's also worth saying that the UK is on a journey here too. We may not have the problems of managing Forex, but we can share challenges around project size, around transparency, and reporting, for instance. I feel we should also make a distinction between London as a green finance center, where it's a burgeoning and extremely active ESG green finance discussion, and the UK as an issue of green debt, whether it's corporate or municipal or sovereign. And as I said, we've approached this issue from the outset from the angle of measuring the risk of climate stress and looking at commercially viable outcomes. If they're not commercially viable, they won't fly. Paris gives the overarching background to this, but we have to live day to day by individual financial decisions on lending, on investing, on insuring. And I am hugely optimistic about the future of this market for reasons which I will now briefly elaborate. Of course, the economic risk of climate change is complex, which is why it's taking some time for a consensus to form. One simple reason is that carbon dioxide emissions are long-lasting with consequences far beyond the normal decision-making horizon. 20 years, not 12 months. Yes, there's a strong scientific consensus on the fundamental connections between greenhouse gas emissions and rising temperatures, but the probability of different economic outcomes is highly uncertain. Even accurately measuring national carbon levels turns out to be more challenging than we thought. So how do we bankers, how do we financiers take that into account? Well, here's the heart of it. The fundamental problem for us in finance is the market failure that occurs when the long-term costs of climate changing emissions do not get taken into account. There's famously a phrase first coined by 19th century William Foster Lloyd, he's an economist, his classic name for the dilemma, the tragedy of the commons. No market player today needs to worry about negative consequences far off in the future. Governor Mark Carney made direct reference to this himself in his tragedy of the horizons. No one today needs to take responsibility for long-term consequences beyond their urgent, traditional, short-term decision-making horizon. It is one failure of traditional capitalism for which it can be criticized. And it's an area of market failure where governments can make a real difference through taxes and through limits on business. In essence, we know we need to move from an economic model that relies on resource depletion today to one that doesn't especially as this has the potential to generate trillions of dollars of additional economic prosperity. Now we understand that, how should we react? At the same time, there's a growing understanding in the finance community of the economic channels through which climate change may affect forecasts and thereby also economic policies and corporate response and share price behavior. This is true of direct physical risks and physical damage, as well as the costs of transitioning to a fossil-free society. In the last year, many of the most newsworthy non-political events here have, been, have involved the short-term impact of extreme weather events, such as the consequences of storms and floods and fires and crop failures. And not just in the US or the Pacific Rim that this is seen. The drought in several European countries has led to forest fires and to lower production and higher prices for agricultural products. This affected balance sheets and share prices across a range of industries. Climate risk became more real. And the economy is going to be affected by political reaction to climate change and by how popular opinion reacts to them. So last year's German economic slowdown was partly due to lower auto production because of new emissions tests in response to Dieselgate. And the yellow vest gilets jaunes protests in France were triggered by political petrol tax increases and contributed to reduced activity in the service sector in the fourth quarter. Jaguar Land Rover wrote off 3.6 billion pounds for last year largely due to political, climate-related decisions about diesel engines. We bankers who lend money to the auto industry are having to change all our internal credit ratings for the sector according to climate criteria, 
and a forecast of what governments are likely to do. This affects the capital we have to allocate to each loan. Jaguar Land Rover, to whom my bank lends, suddenly became a more expensive loan. That's life. This is highly relevant, particularly as we approach an election here in the UK where climate is really on the agenda, and so on. So any banker or investor, UK or Indian, who is not thinking now about how to introduce climate risk into their analysis of companies or their selection of stocks is likely to underperform. Similarly, I don't meet any corporate treasurers or finance officers here in the UK who are not aware of the need to address climate concerns from shareholders, from investors, and from risk analysts. A decade ago, sustainable investment was about signaling awareness, but sometimes at the cost of a slightly lower return. In the last five years, most investors have started to assume that they could do this without sacrificing return. The reality is that both green bonds and sector-neutral equity ESG strategies have been outperforming their benchmarks for at least two years. This is a trend that is here to stay and will get even stronger going forward because now it's not just about signaling awareness, but about mobilizing capital for business investment that can speed up the transition. It's about risk, it's about managing risk, it's just as much about getting a commercial return for doing that. And there are fundamental economic reasons why companies that invest in sustainable technologies are likely to get stronger growth and lower default risk in the future. The renewable energy cluster in particular is already showing growth patterns identical to those seen in earlier product revolutions. The first part of the story is about technology. This says that as the new energy technologies are now superior to the old, even in the absence of a climate crisis, markets would drive up growth and drive down prices at the same time. It's already happening. Solar, it's there. Wind, it's there. Battery, it's clearly coming. Hydrogen power, possibly coming. Tidal, I believe it's a possibility. Fusion, let's see, that may be a bit further off. But for an investor, buying into better technology on a falling cost curve and leading the way embedding those factors into your business model has always been a driver of long-term competitive advantage. You just have to decide what those better technologies are. This was the case with computer chips and memory. The very first wave of electrification, steam engines, it's the same story. Growth up, prices down. Don't we all wish we'd bought shares in Microsoft or Apple in their early days? Or Henry Ford tractors 100 years ago when some people said tractors will never take off from so much more trouble, so much more, less economic than a horse and cart. That's what they said. Maybe they still do in some rural parts of India, but Leaving that aside, the revolution has been extraordinary. Going forwards, lenders and investors are likely to see it as a red flag if companies don't disclose exposures, and they will shift allocations towards those that have the most credible transition plans. It's already happening. The bottom line for equity investors and analysts is clear as well. In the future, every sector research team will have to include a ranking of companies in the energy transition race as part of its company analysis. And investors should abandon sector exclusion strategies, oil and gas, cement, energy, steel, and focus on including sustainability in sector neutral stock selection strategies. The second part of the story is about politics and regulation. All the scientists suggest that renewables growth is not fast enough and we need to move much faster to halt the climate crisis before it's too late. As a result, there is a powerful incentive for societies to speed up the transition process using any means available. Again, regardless of climate discussion, the power of politics and society is there. Politicians know this. They don't always know how to tackle the problem, but they know it's there and that they have to do something, like banning diesel engines or encouraging renewables with subsidies. And I think it's worth saying that the regulators are also playing a key role in, for instance, um, catalyzing TCFD implementation. And through their landmark report, the Network for Greening the Financial System, a network of central banks, has been given very strong statements of intent on climate risk as they measure bank stability. The UK government, led by the Department of, of Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy, very much demonstrating its commitment to addressing climate risk, stimulating a robust environment for green finance through the Clean Growth Strategy and the new Green Finance Institute, which I chair. The Green Finance Institute is financed by government in the City of London in the first instance. It's led by bankers, 
and it's positioned as the principal interface between the public and private sectors regarding the development of green finance, purpose-led finance in the UK. We aim to mobilize capital to fund the transition we needed as quickly as we possibly can and transform the way that we behave financially. And it's happening. Just look at the growth of the ESG, the Environmental, Social and Governance Investment Market. In the four years since the Paris Agreement was signed, the sustainable investment market, which the High Commissioner referred to, grown at an annualized rate of nearly 20%. 2018 saw $60 billion of net inflows into ESG funds and 280 new fund launches. BlackRock predicts that ESG exchange-traded funds will grow to $400 billion in a decade. The phenomenon is especially noticeable in Europe. At the end of 2018, three quarters of all ESG funds were domiciled in Europe, and 88%, nearly 90% of inflows in new funds were from European investors, and primarily driven by European pension funds and policymakers with interest bubbling up across the high net worth and millennial populations as well. And sustainability has emerged from glossy corporate responsibility publications to become a key part of corporate strategy for many of our clients. Oil majors Shell and BP have announced commitment to link executive pay with emission reductions, and 2018 saw more environmental and sustainability shareholder proposals passed than ever before in the United States. And the European Commission has released its most ambitious legislative agenda on sustainable finance to date to incentivize, to mobilize capital flows into climate risk mitigation and adaptation activities. To conclude, I think this UK-India Green Finance Working Group that was set up in 2018 is going to be vital in unlocking the capital for green infrastructure development in India. I hope they will discuss every possible subject, from the role of multinational development banks all the way through down to corporate reporting and the creation of further green finance products. The UK and India-based members of the working group will work towards connecting these opportunities in India with private capital and service providers in London. In particular, the working group will explore both the barriers restricting the flows of capital into viable green projects, which the report elaborates on, and the challenges faced by Indian companies in raising finance. And whilst the report focuses on the challenges to scaling green investments in India, it also makes a series of practical and targeted suggestions for improvement. So there is also a clear role for the UK and Indian governments and for the financial services communities on both sides to step up and take action. I'm looking forward very much to seeing the progress, and I welcome FICCI's enthusiasm, including their offer to host a deep dive roundtable on the report in India for participants to unpack the recommendations and establish a clear set of next steps. I hope we will share our experience and work together. I think we have a lot to learn from each other and to establish a code of best practice which meets the needs and opportunities we each see. And I'm particularly looking forward to holidaying in Rajasthan in February. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir, Roger. I, th I hope we will uh, uh, certainly uh, try to achieve some of the objectives of uh, your way forward, particularly in private equity, in green bonds, and in green growth. That is the end of our first session. Uh, the, we will break for tea, coffee, and we will come back uh, with Lord Gardia chairing the next session at uh, exactly uh, in 25 minutes uh, half 10. We, as you know, we have a very packed program, so therefore uh, we have to get sta stay to the time. So please come on time. And the speakers for the next session, uh, please come five minutes before to get the lap ma ma uh, microphones attached to you before the session is there. Thank you very much. High Commissioner, Lord Amar, Sir Roger, uh, and uh, uh, invite you to tea. Thank you. <laughs>